Hey guys, what's up? What's up? What's up? So today I'm going to talk about the experimentation framework that we built at Wiki. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a software engineer there working for the data team, uh, working on data infrastructure stuff and some other tools held there. So this is one of the tools that we built. So just, add, just as a head, heads up, this talk is not about how awesome Go is or intricacies of Go because uh, I wanted to focus more on an application that we built or a use case we built on top of Go. There's some Go stuff, but uh, most of the stuff you can read online, so I don't want to focus on that. <coughs> so this is the outline of the talk, uh, just giving you an overview on what's, uh, what is A-B testing, why did we choose to do our own framework, um, the challenges that were involved, <coughs> the solution, the approach that we took, uh, usage of this framework at Wiki, and some future tasks for me. So what is A-B testing? <laughs> what? You didn't test it properly. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so what is A-B testing? Does any, like, how many of you guys have heard about A-B testing or have an idea what A-B testing is? Okay, so for the rest of the guys, uh, I mean, it's just another, it's just a subset of experimentation. Uh, really, the tool that we built uh, enables experimentation at Wiki. So A-B testing as such is basically modifying one aspect of your product, which is, uh, I mean, most of the times it's UI aspects changing color of something, or changing placements of something, uh, and keeping everything else the same. And, uh, and, and then you measure how your audience or your users react to that change. Uh, then, I mean, you have multiple of these A-B tests running, so you have a, you, you call them variations. So you have, let's say, a variation A, variation B, and a control variation, that's called C. And then you see how variation A and B performed compared to the control variation. If they perform better, you end up choosing that and you make it the default. So this is sort of the overall of A-B testing. Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, it's important to keep a control group uh, like any other experiment. And also, you only want to experiment on a certain percentage of your user base. For two reasons. One, your users will get annoyed if you're experimenting on everyone. Uh, second, if you experiment on everyone, then you can only run one experiment at one time. <coughs> So why did we choose to do our own framework? Uh, this stuff already out there, uh, like Optimizely and a bunch of other uh, tools which you can pay for and use. There's also open source stuff by Facebook, Cloudera, um, <coughs> Etsy and stuff. Uh, either it is, like, either it does not have the features we need, or it had extra features uh, uh, that we did not need, or it wasn't very customizable. And also one thing we really wanted was to reduce the dependency on engineers for changes in like tests. So initially, yes, their input is required, their work is required, but once the test starts running and once you have to set up more tests, we didn't want to bother the engineers with that. So, it, so all of these frameworks kind of didn't fit into our uh, requirements, so we decided to do it on our own. And yeah, we needed to be robust, we needed to be really fast because uh, our applications hit this framework first before they start building the UI and it becomes a blocking block. So, and if it is slow, it could really mar the user experience. Um, question. Um, so how, how does this, uh, so you mentioned that, that one of the, the requirements to reduce dependencies <coughs> in engineers, um, but you know, using one of those frameworks which you, you mentioned earlier would, would help uh, in that requirement, wouldn't it? Uh, so it's it's more like once. So I'm I'm not talking in context of developing the framework. Yes, if you don't develop the framework, then you reduce development dependency, of course. Sure. But if you're just talking about running tests, then some of these frameworks require you to actually write code uh, to even run tests, to change tests, to make API calls. Whereas what we wanted was a UI where like a product manager can work with and just create mm -hmm. tests and observe in like a dashboard. So, <coughs> so what are the challenges involved? Uh, one, of course, is speed. Uh, as I mentioned, we need it, it to be really, really fast so that it does not hamper the user experience. 
Second, it needs to be flexible. <coughs> we have our applications on different platforms, like iOS, Android, uh, <coughs> web, which is a real app, uh, Flash Player, and if we even try to use it for external parties. <coughs> so it's really like different kinds of platform. So it needs to be flexible and platform independent. Also flexible in terms of uh, targeting users by country, a certain user type, <coughs> and different. I mean, different things which are very like maybe quite custom to Wiki. Uh, it needs to be scalable uh, because again, like all our apps are hitting this endpoint. <coughs> it needs to be highly available and scalable. I'm sorry. Uh, again, we need to do partition of users because you can't test on 100% of your traffic. So we need to divide the users into buckets. Stickiness is important. So what I mean by stickiness is if I, as a user, see, uh, undergo a particular test right now, then I should see the same test every time I go to Wiki as long as the test is live, uh, which is part of A-B testing, right? I mean, you don't want a user to experience something once and then switch the test. Yeah, and doing all of that at the same time is kind of tough because if you're trying to do partitioning and stickiness, then you lose out on speed. If you're trying to, again, like do scalability, then you might not be able to partition the users properly. So this, this was the challenge. So uh, we decided to <coughs> implement it on, on our own. So, uh, the framework, we, we call it Turing. Uh, it, so this is like a high level architecture view of it. Uh, this is your UI admin application, which is with, with which basically the product managers interact and set experiments and stuff. And uh, this also provides a uh, API to the Go application. So it's not just the the framework is not just Go application; it's a Rails application and a Go application. I'll come to the reasons why we chose to do it the way we did it. The Go application take does like timely syncs from the API of basically the stuff that has been sent in the UI, and it maintains in-memory hashes, and then. Uh, your Go API basically reads from those in-memory hashes. And then it serves to the clients. So the clients are making calls directly to the Go API. So we chose to do it in, we chose to do it in API in Go because of, uh, <coughs> of course, speed and some other reasons which I'll talk about. Rails, we chose because of admin UI. Um, I mean, I don't think Go is very ideal to build UI apps right now. Uh, and I mean, of, we were very time bound, so we just chose whatever tool was best. Uh, for that purpose. <coughs> so how often do, do you do the timely sync? Uh, right now it's about five minutes. Yeah, it's a parameter. I mean, ideally your experiments don't change that often, so you can keep it 15 minutes, half an hour. But even if it's like a minute, it does not really matter. Oh, from Karen, Sheldon, I. Uh, so, okay, well, again, like speed is very critical for this API endpoint or this uh, framework. So how do we make it really fast? The current time on the server side for the response is about 300 microseconds on an average. Uh, so of course, the API is in Golang uh, and Martini. Uh, we store everything in, uh, in memory hashes, so it does not make any external call, not even like a Redis cache. Anything that could slow it down, it does not make it. <coughs> I'm actually looking for like fast alternatives to uh, Martini, so I've looked into Gin, which is pretty fast. Maybe <coughs> Bigo. So, so this is uh, this is more of like the Go tools that I use. Uh, so for timely syncs, uh, I spawn a Go routine every X minutes, which is five minutes, and uh, update the data structures from the API. So I get the information from the API, update the in-memory data structures. Uh, which enable like fast lookups. Uh, so also, <coughs> I need to use a mutex, <coughs> rewrite mutex, um, so that the data does not, like, so that I don't get garbage data. Basically, when I'm updating a hash value, then I should not be reading from. So this is like stuff that I use from Go. I mean, everything is in Go, but this is like particular to Go. So these are some of the advantages that I thought, uh, uh, I mean, one of the few of the reasons I chose Go language for an 
advantages I realized after choosing Go languages. One is, of course, you can run it as a binary. So uh, deployment became much easier, and we use Docker for deployment. Uh, even building a Docker for a Go app is much, much easier than Rails or other apps, because there's no, you don't have to bother too much about dependencies. Uh, static type checking is really good, because uh, uh, it reduces the number of runtime errors. <coughs> And it forces you to write, you know, like the right code. You can't have extra variables dangling here and there. Uh, and again, it's a good uh, trade-off between performance and development speed. So I think at that time I was looking at Node.js and Go for like a faster API. But Node.js has a bit of bit more of a learning curve, and Go was something which uh, we could easily pick up and start working with. And again, like on performance side, it was really good. Good trade off. Uh, so, one of the aspects is, of course, uh, as I talked about, stickiness is in, and partitioning the users into buckets, right? Uh, there's multiple <coughs> ways, excuse me, there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, I could have like a Redis cache, um, I could, I mean, any sort of cache or database where I can maintain uh, what users saw what variation till the time. Uh, experiment expires, or uh, or I could like for <coughs> partitioning I could just keep on putting users in a bucket and when if that bucket is full I can choose the next bucket or I can randomize on buckets and tag the users to a particular bucket. But then again I uh, realized it would increase the response times because again this calls to databases or uh, a Redis in memory cache. So we decided to do it this way where we are basically dividing <coughs> the user base into 10 buckets, and each user uh, is hashed into one bucket based on some hashing algorithm. Um, and actually, yeah, and uh, also the variation itself. So this is more on the partitioning side, right? How do I partition a user into 10 buckets? Like all the users into 10 different buckets. And then the stickiness is actually this part. So I also, the variations, I have to point them to certain buckets. So I basically hash the variation IDs and point them to certain buckets. So that makes it sticky. The variation will go to the same bucket all the time, and the user will go to the same bucket all the time. So by doing this, I don't have to maintain any extra database or any extra Redis instance or anything. This was like a big, uh, I mean, like a big. Uh, um, it was a bit like on on. It helped me quite a lot to push it out faster. Uh, because if I use like any other sort of implementation, uh, since this is a globally distributed app, we have about eight instances of it running uh, across the world. It database syncs or deployments or reading from queues and writing workers and stuff uh, would have needed more time. So this was something that really helped a lot. Uh, so a little bit more into how this features and variations and stuff work, especially for us. So I, I, I'll start with an example. So let's say a feat, uh, feature is a home page. So we want to <coughs> customize the home page for Wiki, right? which we do, by the way, on mobile phones using the same framework. Uh, a feature can have different variations, and variations are of three types. So first is the default variation. So let's here we say, OK, the default variation, uh, we serve version 0. Then you have a setting which has a certain, cer certain conditions to it. So only for US, we'll serve version 1. And then you have experiments. So we say, OK, for Singapore, from today to tomorrow, we'll serve version 2. But this is only going out to 10% of the traffic. So this <coughs> setting is 200% of the traffic, which meets the criteria. But this is only to 10% of the traffic. And then again, the second experiment is a control experiment here, because it matches the default. Uh, it's also country, Singapore, from today to tomorrow. Uh, yeah, you serve uh, bay, uh, version 0 as a home page. <clears throat> so the client gets these values. It knows how to interpret it and serve the right version of the home page. This is how it works out on the API side. Basically, we run through all the features, all the eligible features for that application and that release version. And for each feature, we run through all the variations in this order. First, we figure out if there is an eligible experiment. If there is an eligible experiment, we check if that experiment 
falls into the right bucket. So if, if it falls it falls into the el eligible bucket, like if that user is in that 10% or not. If it is not, then we go to settings. Uh, we uh, <laughs> iterate through all the settings and see if there's a matching setting. Uh, if there is, we serve that. Otherwise, we ultimately we go down to the default mode. So there's always a response for a particular feature, but we have to follow this like sort of hierarchical <coughs> flow uh, that we go through. Any questions regarding this or previous slide? So uh, we had we did some further optimizations as well. Uh, like we on the UI side, there is you can tag a release with features. Uh, so let's say our Android application, it has about 20, 30 features that you for it, but each release may only go out with 10 features. So it, so on when we are checking it on the API side, we only check against those 10 features. So it's much faster. Uh, yeah, and there's a bunch of conditions. So if any of the conditions don't satisfy, we like, you know, we don't have to check further. And yeah, you won't believe what happened next. Uh, so we didn't imagine it to have like a lot of use cases at Wiki while we were building it. We made it flexible enough, but primarily it was an A-B testing platform. Uh, by now, we're using it for feature tackling, uh, feature tweaking. So like we tweak a feature, feature a bit, and then we see uh, based on how users react, we keep on tweaking it. So it's not really A-B testing, but it's feature tweaking. Uh, feature customization, so we can we are able to serve uh, different uh, video streams, <coughs> like uh, different video stream qualities in different countries, or even by uh, uh, even by <coughs> certain other conditions. Um, we're doing rollout, so our recommendation system we roll it out using the same framework, uh, country by country and percentage by percentage. So like initially we rolled it out to ten percent in U.S. Slowly we increase the percentage. S compared uh, the new recommendations to the old recommendations, and then s we did a slow roll out of that. Uh, of course, we're running A-B tests. <coughs> I think one of the major A-B tests running right now is uh, ads experience. So we're trying to optimize uh, the ads experience that users have for high revenue and good experience. <coughs> and we're also sending like in-app messages through the system on our mobile platforms. Do you guys use Wiki here, anyone? Yeah. Watch this. Drama. You might want to check it out after this. Like you can go, you can go on the homepage. Maybe next time you'll see a different homepage, and you'll be like, "I know why that happens." Uh, yeah. So this is like a segue, but I just wanted to put it there. Uh, we are, we are. Apparently, there's already another meetup group, but we have this, we run this Facebook group because Wiki is heavily into Docker, and all our production systems is, are in Docker. So we are trying to build the community in Singapore, and we want to host the first meetup. Uh, like one month from now. So if you would like to speak, drop me an email. Uh, or if you know anyone who would like to speak, drop me an email as well. Uh, yeah. They will be free food as well. Uh, next steps to that, um, we want to make the percentages more granular. So right now it's like 10%. Ideally, it should be like 1%, 2%. Like you should be able to choose any percentage you want. Again, variable percentages for each experiment. You may not want to run it for 10%. Maybe you want 30%. So I need to do that. And uh, yeah, change from Martini to a faster web server. I'm looking at Jin right now. It seems quite promising. Personalization is another thing we are looking at. So being able to serve a personalized home page rather than just, you know, like, a, like right now you are in like, the users are in groups. But ideally, we want to be able to serve like a personal home page to every, every user. Uh, and also, hopefully, open source it in the future so the community can benefit from it. <laughs> Thank you, man. We are hiring in platform, data, everything. Interns as well. So if you guys want interns, yeah, that's it. Cool. Any questions? Uh, have, you, have you considered uh, like a DSL, like Gherkin or something? I noticed your syntax all JSON based, right? Like, you know, Gherkin, like English kind of. Syntax where you can actually write. <laughs> so, I guess when we were building it, we weren't really sure how it's how it was going to be used. Mm -hmm. So we wanted something which is very flexible and anyone can sort of <coughs> use it. 
So JSON kind of fit the bill. Yeah. We didn't look too much. We were thinking about looking into some sort of DSL, but uh, yeah, we didn't decide. But maybe something that's something I can look into. I don't have too much experience with the. Mm -hmm. That's something I can look into. Yeah. It'll be more user friendly. Sure. Any questions, comments? Any other questions? No?